بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين I hope everyone's doing well inshallah I hope everyone's doing well on this blessed night mashallah of uh, the day of Friday um, Today we're going to talk about a very exciting topic, a topic that's very dear to my heart um, and inshallah this will be the first of a series that we're planning to do all throughout the Bay Area and this is a lecture series focused on the Quran but from a different perspective than we're usually used to seeing this type of discussion a lot of times we um, learn about the Quran, we learn about the different parts of the Quran and we attend lectures related to the Quran and the focus is on the meaning of a particular surah, a particular passage, a particular important ayah in the Qur'an. But there's another aspect of the study of the Qur'an, which is the study of what is the Qur'an. And studying and understanding what is this Qur'an that I am meant to build a relationship with. And part of the motivation of studying this science, and we'll talk about it in a minute, part of that motivation is when we're trying to build a relationship with a human being, we try to learn as much as we can about that person. Yes, there's also experiences we have with the people that we have around us, our friends, our family. And those experiences shape us and mold us in many, many ways. But part of building that relationship is also learning about that person. You know, what is that person like? What do they like? What do they dislike? Uh, what, are, what are things they enjoy? Etc., etc. And so similarly, the Qur'an, which is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, deserves a similar type of attention from us so that we can um, be more intimately connected with the details of the Qur'an. So inshallah, today's um, talk will be focusing on two main things. The first is understanding what do we mean when we say the Qur'an. When we usually mention you know, the Qur'an or I read some Qur'an yesterday or you know, there's a Qur'an class going on, uh, all of those times, like we kind of have an idea of what it is, but if someone asked you, like, okay, so what is it? So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. How do you define the Quran? And the second part, inshallah, the second part of the, the talk, inshallah, will be on revelation. We talk about how the Quran has been revealed to us through the Prophet. ﷺ. But what does it mean for something to be revealed? What is revelation? What are the different types of revelation? Is the Qur'an the only type of revelation? And what are the differences between the different types of revelation? And then inshallah we'll go into a little bit on exactly how the Qur'an was revealed on the Prophet Sallallahu over many, many years and what were the different wisdoms and benefits that we can um, acquire from that. So inshallah we'll get started with the first part of this presentation in which we'll talk about the definition of the Qur'an. So how do we define something or someone? So if I'm trying to define, for example, my friend Ahmed, there are a couple of ways that I can define who he is. One is, I can say, well, his name is Ahmed. This is how you point at him. Or if he's standing here, I can be like, oh, this is Ahmed. Right? So that's one way we can do that, pointing at them. The second is describing their characteristics, their origins, their background, different facts about them. Like for example, Ahmed likes to play soccer, Ahmed likes to read um, stories, Ahmed likes to go hiking, etc., etc. He likes the color blue. All these are different you know, characteristics. He's an engineer, whatever it is. All these different characteristics and descriptions of my friend. And so that's another way that we can understand who a person is and define a person. So how can we define the Qur'an? Because the way we as Muslims are told to approach the Qur'an is similar to how we approach another person. So we'll take those same two approaches and define the Qur'an in two ways. So the first one is the Qur'an is the book that is in front of me. I don't have a Qur'an with me unfortunately, but um, let's just imagine that this, because it has a PDF of the Qur'an inside it, this is the Qur'an, and I'm holding it and I say, this is the Qur'an, it's what's between these two covers, that is the Qur'an, right? That's one way of de uh, defining it, just as how I can point to my friend and say, this is Ahmed. And the second way to define it is a more detailed description of exactly what the Qur'an is. And it consists of six descriptions. 
And these six descriptions together give you the very precise meaning of what the Qur'an is. And there's nothing else that can be part of this definition, nothing that's accidentally included because these six uh, descriptions are very carefully chosen by the scholars. So the definition goes, number one, it's the inimitable, inimitable, I can never say this word unfortunately, inimitable uh, speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inimitable means uh, something that cannot be copied. It cannot be imitated. It is unimitatable, essentially. Um, so that's the first characteristic. It's the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second is that it is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was revealed upon the final prophet and messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through the archangel, archangel Jibreel alayhi salam. So this second description differentiates the Qur'an from all of the previous scriptures that came to all the previous prophets. Number three, that is written in the quote-unquote Masahif. Now Masahif is an interesting discussion and inshallah in the future we'll have a, a dedicated uh, talk on this topic as well. But for our purposes here, at the time of the Prophet wasallam, as the Qur'an was being revealed to the people, the Prophet ﷺ would have scribes around him that were assigned to the role of writing the Qur'an down to make sure that it was preserved. And as we'll see in a couple of slides as well, there were two ways that the Qur'an was preserved. Number one was through memory. So initially, Jibreel salam brought the Qur'an down to the Prophet ﷺ and he preserved it in his memory. And then many of the companions around the Prophet ﷺ heard the Qur'an from his blessed mouth they heard it and they memorized it as well. So it was preserved in memory from heart to heart to heart until today. That's one way. The other way was through writing. And that writing was standardized once at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu when it was collected into one volume. Before it was different sahaba who had, you know, I have one juz here written. I have one piece that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa reciting one time. This is the one part that I recited to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And so everyone had their own portions, their own pieces that they had collected. At the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, they collected it all into one compilation, one book that had the entire Qur'an from beginning to end. Then later on in the time of the third uh, righteous caliph, Uthman radiallahu anhu, they decided that we need to now copy this one mushaf, this one Qur'an, one written copy of the Qur'an, into multiple copies that can each be sent to one of the big cities across the Muslim world. Because the Muslim Ummah is now very big. People in every single region need one copy that they can keep going back to so they can know that they are reading the Quran correctly. That there are no mistakes that are creeping in. Because obviously memory is very, very important and it's like the first way of preserving the Quran. But as human beings, our memory isn't perfect. So we will have lapses, we might forget, and there might be a disagreement between two people on what the right way was. And so there is a written copy in every one of the major cities in the Muslim world, including Mecca, Medina, uh, uh, two cities in Iraq, Kufa and Basra, and then also in Syria. So the Quran that was revealed on the Prophet wasallam and was written and preserved in the Mus'hafs, in the Masahif, these uh, written copies of the Quran. And number four, that was then mass transmitted to us from the Prophet Sallallahu to us today. And so this is addressing now the, the other aspect of per preservation through memory, through the hearts. But if I heard something from my friend and then I go and tell my neighbor that I heard such and such thing from my friend, he can be like, okay, sure, that's nice. And he's like, okay, so what did I tell him? It's like, oh, I told him that um, my house was on fire. And so he's like, oh, okay, interesting. That's, that's really sad to hear. And there could be a chance that um, I'm lying, I'm making something up, some kind of distortion has entered in. And so the message, as we've seen also in the game of telephone that we play as children, you, you have one message and it goes around, around, around. And by the end of it, unintentionally, the message has kind of distorted to something completely different. So to preserve the Quran through memory, what happened is that there were so many people in the companions that had heard the Qur'an from the Prophet ﷺ that when the next generation came and they heard the entire Qur'an from one companion, then from another companion, 
then from another companion, then from another companion. So many companions I hear the Qur'an from, at this point there's no doubt in my mind that this is exactly how the Prophet ﷺ recited the Qur'an. If one person recited it to me, there's like a little bit of a chance that they might have forgotten something. But if 20 people recited it to me, exactly the same way, then I'm 100% sure that this is exactly how it was. And similarly, in the case of like, for example, there was a fire in my neighborhood. One person tells me that, I'm like, okay, maybe this person's making it up. Then I'm walking down the street, another person tells me the same thing. I walk down the street, a third person tells me the same thing, and they're all different people who don't know each other. At the end of this interaction with three people, I am 100% sure this was a fact that happened. There was a house that burned in our neighborhood. And so that's what the transmission of the Qur'an was like as well. It was mass transmitted. And the word in Arabic for this is mutawatir. Number five. Its recitation is a means of worship. And this is a unique um, virtue that is given to the Qur'an and to no other text. Because it's the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just the single act of reading the Qur'an has a reward. As the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes, Every single word that you read in the Qur'an has ten rewards for it. And then he says, لا أقول ألف لا ميم حرف I'm not saying that ألف لا ميم is one word in this context. لكن ألف حرف ولا من حرف وميم حرف But rather, for ألف you will get the ten rewards, for لام you will get the ten rewards, and for ميم you will get the ten rewards. But what is the most significant part of this entire narration is the example that the Prophet ﷺ chose. He chose Alif Lam Meme. That is something that nobody knows for sure what it means. The scholars have tried and attempted to you know, say, oh, maybe it could mean this, it could mean this. But at the end of the day, they say Allah knows best. These words that happen at the beginning of the different surahs, Alif Lam Meme, Ha Meme, um, Alif Lam Ra, all of these uh, broken, disjointed letters that we pronounce, no scholar in the entire history of Islam has been able to say 100% sure I know what this means. And that is the example the Prophet chooses, chooses here. Because it is not connected to the meaning. In and of itself, the word of the Qur'an has reward in it, it is a means of worship. It is a means of us getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That does not mean at all that the meaning is not important. Of course, the meaning is the most important because at the end of the day, the Qur'an's main purpose is a book of guidance. It's a book of principles that can take us through this difficult life. But that's important, but that does not diminish the fact that every single word that we utter with our mouths of this Qur'an gives us reward and has blessing for us in ways that we cannot even imagine. And that is not true for any other book in this world. And the last description here about what the Qur'an is, is that it begins with Surah Al-Fatiha and ends with Surah Al-Nas. And this just gives us sort of like, you know, the beginning and end, just the limits of what the Qur'an is. Alright. So after having understood what the Qur'an is, the next discussion is what are the names of the Qur'an? Because something that we will realize when we start reading the Qur'an and we start looking at translations of the Qur'an is that the Qur'an is unique in an aspect that is very, very rare to find. The Qur'an references itself. It talks about its own truth. It talks about it being the guiding light for people. And that's a very... It's a self-referential characteristic that the Qur'an has. And it almost makes it feel like it's a real person. A person that you can have a communication with, you can have a relationship with. Because as a person, I can talk about myself. I can tell you who I am, I can tell you what I do. The Qur'an also tells us what it is. It tells us what its purpose is. Its purpose is guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In the Qur'an, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ Surely this Qur'an leads to that which is most upright. And so, the discussion on the names of the Qur'an is kind of unique 
because uh, one of the things that we kind of don't have in our culture today is um, a lot of titles. But some people might be familiar with this from other cultures that they might be familiar with, where there's this um, habit that people have of you know, important people, dignitaries, they will have like 15 titles. Like you'll hear like, you know, His Highness, the most powerful, the, the this, the ruler of the, the seven seas and the custodian of the whatevers and like the this and that. Like, you know, they get like 15 different titles for a, for a person. What's the point of those titles? You saying those titles is not making that person any better. It's not giving them more power or anything like that. But the point of mentioning all those names is to show the honor and the status of that person. You are expressing this person in so many different ways to give us different ways of appreciating who this person is. And similarly for the Quran, there are many, many names. So the names fall under two different categories. The first are proper names. They're names that are, the Quran uses itself to refer to itself. The first one is Al-Quran, Quran that we're used to saying. And the second one is Al-Kitab. And these two are the main ones. And these two words, in their meaning, there is sort of two layers that we can appreciate. At the base layer, both the word Qur'an and the word Kitab mean something that is compiled, essentially a book. So they're both referring to a book. But at a deeper level, Qur'an refers to a book that is recited. And Kitab refers to a book that is written. And these two words being used within the Qur'an to refer to itself is a strong indication to us and a, um, an indication to the fact that this is going to be how the Qur'an will be preserved through these two mechanisms. It's a book that will both be preserved through writing and through reading, through memory. And that's one of the really um, fascinating aspects of the names of the Qur'an. There are some other names as well, like Al-Furqan, which means the criterion because the Qur'an is the criterion that tells us what is right and what is wrong. It's our moral compass, it's our ethical guide in this world. We go back to the Qur'an to get the principles with which we can live our life. That is Al-Furqan. Now the second category of names in the, of the Qur'an are descriptions given to the Qur'an within the Qur'an. I'll list a few of them here. Shifa. Shifa is a cure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَشِفَاءُ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ And it is a cure for what is in the hearts, what is in the chests. And there are many, many verses in which he refer, Allah, he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Qur'an as shifa, as a cure. And the scholars have practiced on this throughout the generations, in that whenever there's a sick person, they recite Qur'an next to them frequently, hoping for the blessings of the Qur'an to help this person in their affliction. And then there are specific surahs that are also recited in, in, in front of the sick person, in front of the person who is passing away, to give them ease, to give them a little bit more um, mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second description is rahmah. The Qur'an is a mercy and there's no denying it. Every single principle, every single ruling that is in the Qur'an, every single thing we learn from the Qur'an is a mercy not only for us but for everyone around us. And the more we engage with the Qur'an, the more we will start to embody this principle of mercy within our own lives. Because it's a description of my friend, eventually I will start to adopt the characteristics of my friend. So if I become a friend of the Qur'an, then this mercy will become part of who I am. And there are many other descriptions as well, inshallah, for those who are interested. Uh, going through the Qur'an, whether in translation or in Arabic, and just like looking at how is the Qur'an described by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very fruitful exercise. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. And as I mentioned earlier, the Qur'an is self-referential. And this is important for us in building our relationship with it. The more we understand about the characteristics of the Qur'an, the better we will be able to build our relationship with it. All right. So the first section was a little bit shorter. And that was just understanding what the Qur'an is, the different names of the Qur'an. Now the second part of this discussion, inshallah, will be a little bit more detailed. And this is going to be about the revelation of the Qur'an. We said in our definition earlier that the Qur'an is the word of Allah. But how does the word of Allah, Allah who is not bound by time or space, Allah who is beyond all of creation, 
How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send this word to us, the creation, who live in time and space, who live in this physical world? So we'll start off by discussing what is revelation. We've mentioned this word a couple of times already. But what exactly does this word mean? In Arabic, the word is wahi, al-wahi. Wow, ha, ya. Now, the scholars, they are very particular and very uh, precise in how they discuss terminology, how they discuss topics. They'll start off by discussing how did the Arabs at the time of the Prophet wasallam before Islam, what was their usage of this word? How did they use it generally speaking? Because a lot of times what happens is that the Quran and the Prophet wasallam and our religion, when it came down on this culture, this society, it took terms and words and concepts that they had in their society and it modified them a little. And this is one of the concepts that the scholars bring up a lot, which is that Islam does not come to destroy cultures. It does not come to destroy societal norms. It comes to modify them. It comes to remove the harmful aspects of them. And it corrects it to the right path, to the path which is more beneficial for people. So what is the original definition, the original meaning of the word why? So there's two meanings here. One is the meaning of an indication. And the other is the meaning of teaching in a subtle way. And this meaning is something we're going to see coming up in that more technical definition, the way it's defined in our religion, in our Islamic sciences. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran to the Prophet wasallam, everyone else on the earth couldn't see this revelation happening to the Prophet those who were right around him could see the effects of it on the Prophet ﷺ. But the actual instruction and the actual teaching that was happening, the words that were coming from Allah to the Prophet ﷺ, nobody could see them happening. There was no physical book that was coming to the Prophet ﷺ. So it was in a very subtle way that it was coming in. And it was again, it was an indication to the Prophet ﷺ about what is the right way to proceed. What are the words to say at this occasion? What are the words of Allah wa ta'ala pertaining to this matter? So the technical definition of wahi or revelation is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs a prophet among his prophets in a certain manner about their prophethood. Now that just sounds like a lot of words repeated one after the other, but the whole idea is before the Prophet wasallam became a prophet, he was a regular human being living on earth, interacting with people, going to the market, doing his work, interacting with his family, all of those things. There was nothing unique yet. But then something happens which changes his status from a regular human being to a prophet. That, that thing that happens is revelation. It is a connection between this physical, finite world and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is infinite and beyond the physical world. Once that connection happens the first time, now this person is called a prophet. And that prof prophethood begins with revelation. And that's all that's saying. And then afterwards, as after this person becomes a prophet, then for the remainder of their time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inform them of the things related to being a prophet. For example, what are the commands? What are the prohibitions? What are things that the, you need to tell your people that they are doing wrong? What are the things they are doing right? And what are the things that they are doing wrong? So that is revelation. It's a means of communication between the divine and this world. So the Prophet wasallam, just like every other previous Prophet, was the connection, was the, almost, you can, you can almost say like the means of communication between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they were chosen for this task. And at this point, there's a very interesting quote. Um, I was, when I was, while I was preparing for this uh, talk, I wasn't sure exactly where to put it. Um, <coughs> There were several places that this could have gone. And so Al-Hasan al-Basri, who was one of the uh, pious predecessors of our ummah, one of the greatest scholars to have ever lived in this ummah, and who was also one of the greatest uh, khatibs and orators who have ever lived. And his speeches have been preserved to, for us to this day. He said, those before you would see the Qur'an as letters from their Lord. They would spend their nights pondering over them, and they would spend their days missing them. And the reason why I thought to include it on this website, of, on this slide, uh, was because we had just talked about the Prophet ﷺ being this means 
of communication between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and us. Now I want us to take this to our own context. You have a very good friend, a best friend, somebody who you've been friends with for many years. You have a phone on which you text them, you talk to them, but in the daytime you have to go to work. They have to go to work, they have to they get busy with their life, you get busy with your life during the daytime. So, you know, you spend your day, you're like, oh, you know, I can't wait to like, you know, you know, message my friend, call my friend, talk to them later on. You know, it's just like a really good time whenever I'm interacting with them. And similarly, the Prophet wasallam, one of his main goals, one of his main missions was to connect us to our Creator, the one who brought us into existence. And so one of the scholars that I was, uh, I, I can't remember his name, I happened to hear him discussing this exact quote from Hassan al-Basri. And he was saying, you can also look at this as their love letters from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us so much. In every sentence, in every ayah of the Qur'an, you feel the mercy and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the harshest of ayahs in the Qur'an. If you really think about it, it's something that we need. It's out of Allah's mercy that He gave us that harsh ayah in that place, in that context. And that's part of the mercy and the, the love that is built into the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this world. And that's something we can't really say about any other book. There can be the nicest book, the most eloquent book written by a very righteous person, but it will never compare with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book because it is personalized to every single one of us. Every single person reads that same Qur'an and they get their own benefits from it. They're reading the same meaning, but it applies in their life in a different way. And it just makes sense to them in a way that doesn't make sense to other people. And that's why we see throughout the last 1400 years, every generation, scholars continue to write more and more commentaries on the Qur'an and if the meanings of the Qur'an were like limited or, you know, it was just like, you get it, you move on, it's a simple meaning, you're good, you got an A. Then the first generation would have done that for us and that would be it. But every next generation that came, they built on the previous generation's work, they expanded further, they reflected even more on the concepts that are being discussed in this book. And they realized that there are so many more wisdoms and secrets within those same words. Um, there's a saying that says, لا تنقضي عجائبه. The wonders of this book do not end. Every single word, they say that if you spend your entire life pondering over every, every single word of the Qur'an, you can keep deriving more and more wisdoms and benefits out of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to do that. Ameen. Alright. So we've understood what the revelation is. That is the communication between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and an individual who becomes the Prophet, who is granted the status of prophethood. Now what are the different types of revelation? And is the Qur'an the only type of revelation? Because we talked about the Qur'an earlier. We talked about what the Qur'an is and what the Qur'an is not. Now, what are the different types of revelation and how does the Qur'an fit into this? So Imam al-Juwaini, who is uh, the teacher of the famous Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, he is a an excellent uh, scholar and academic and he wrote some piercing works and one of the really well organized things that he mentions that scholars later on continuously like you know copy and paste essentially citing back to him again and again because it was done really well was on the types of revelation so Imam al-Juwaini describes that there's revelation of two types and then he gives it a very vivid and very beautiful example of us understanding how to make sense of that. Because if you just look at it in terms of, okay, there's two types of revelation. Okay, cool. Let's talk about what they are. Non-literal, literal. Okay. One of them contains just the meaning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other one contains the meaning and the wording from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, that sounds cool. That's like another fact to add to our you know, book of facts. But why, why is that significant? Why is that unique? And why are those two different? So Imam al-Juwaini gives us um, sort of an example for us to ponder upon. And obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above any examples, but these examples help us understand things better. So starting off with the non-literal revelation. This is a type of revelation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the meaning to the Prophet sallallahu and then the Prophet sallallahu expresses it using his own words. And so Imam al-Juwaini says that this is like a king ordering someone in his court 
He says, take a message from me to so-and-so, to Ahmad over there. Tell him um, to show up in court tomorrow. Now, what is the king telling this person? He's telling him, take this message to, this, to Ahmad. It doesn't matter what words you're using. It doesn't matter if you use the exact words I used or you use your own words. That person is going to show up there. He's going to be like, oh, the king's ordering you to come tomorrow. Because that's the point. The point is to get the message across, the meaning across. As opposed to the second category. We'll get to that. So this first, okay, that's, I think there's a typo in the slide. That is not supposed to be the Quran. <laughs> um, so the non-literal revelation is the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, which has been preserved for us in the form of hadith. The sayings, the doings, and the things that the Prophet wasallam approved in his lifetime. Those things have been preserved for us in the form of these snapshots. Like as the companion says, oh, I saw the Prophet wasallam one day doing this thing. Another companion says, I saw the Prophet Sallallahu one day speaking to us and he reminded us of this very important lesson. So it's almost like snapshots, it's almost like tweets that we can imagine a person that is tweeting a message. That is not all they do in their entire life. But it's just one snapshot into what they're thinking about that day. One snapshot about what they've been processing that day. And so similarly, the companions captured some of their experience with the Prophet Sallallahu in what they passed on to their students and to their students all the way until today. So that's a non-literal revelation. Then comes the literal revelation, in which both the words and the meanings are from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. When Jibreel Alayhi Salam brought literal revelation to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala gave him the words that were going to be said by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he would come down to the Prophet Sallallahu He would teach him those words. The Prophet Sallallahu would repeat them to the, the, to the angel Jibreel. And then those words were then preserved by this Ummah until today. This is the Qur'an. But what is the example of this? Going back to what Imam Al-Juwaini was saying. He said this is like a king sending an official edict. Like a whole, like a written down farman. Like a signed document, a proclamation. From the king, he says, here, take this message to the people. Now the messenger is going to go take this edict from the king, and he's going to go and read it word for word. Because this is a very important message from the king. This is something where the king wants every word to be noticed and every word to be considered. And that's the difference between the non-literal revelation and the literal revelation. The literal revelation has a higher status. It has wisdoms not only in its meaning, but also in its wording. So if you open up a book of tafsir, a lot of the discussions they have are related to why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose this word in this place? Why did He not choose another synonym here? What is the connection between this word and the meaning here? And a particular place where uh, this is uh, often a reflection of the scholars of tafsir is at the ends of the ayahs, we often see, إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ rahim. Allah is all forgiving, all merciful. Inna Allah azizun hakim. Allah is almighty, all wise. These are different attributes of Allah. What do they have to do with the message that came before? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about paradise or hellfire or some other message, why is there a constant reminder of certain attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so one of the reflections that the scholars then go through is well, how does this attribute? relate to this message because it's important Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not place any word in here for no reason there is a reflection there waiting for us and it just takes our effort to go and get it and so coming back to this example the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam just as the, every single message of a king is important to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam of course we follow. We are ordered to follow it and we follow it with our hands and eyes. I think that makes no sense in English, but I was thinking of another example in my head. But anyways, um, we'll move on. Um, every single command of the Prophet said, every single thing he has told us to do is equal in terms of its obligation on us as what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, tells us in the Quran, وَاطِعُ اللَّهَ وَاطِعُ Rasul," And obey Allah and obey the Messenger of Allah. Both of them are together. There's no separation here. However, the main core message 
kind of like the constitution is the Qur'an. And then the explanation of this Qur'an, how do we contextualize this into our lives? How do we apply it into our lives? That's what the Sunnah gives us. It clarifies, it explains, it expounds on the Qur'an. Similar to how in the founding of this country we had the constitution and then we had the federalist papers that were in all these like tens of papers that were just explaining how to run the country. Both of them are used today in the court of law. Both of them are important for how this country functions. But there's a hierarchy there. And it's a, it's a harmonious balance between them. Similarly, the Quran and the Sunnah, there is a hierarchy there. The Quran is the literal word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they both work harmoniously together. I apologize for the switch in the words there. So that brings up a question. So I just defined the Quran as being the literal revelation and the Sunnah as being the non-literal revelation. So the Hadith are going to be part of non-literal revelation. Some of you might have heard of the concept of a divine narration, a Hadith Qudsi. So how does that fit into this, con this discussion? So the scholars explain that the Hadith Qudsi is a non-literal revelation, but it is of a higher status and rank than the other uh, narrations from the Prophet ﷺ. So much so that when the Prophet ﷺ narrates these, and this is how we know that they are divine narrations, it's the, usually we say, you know, the so-and-so companion, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, the companion, he said that the Prophet ﷺ said X, Y, and Z. Or Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Islam is built on five pillars. That's the statement, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it. End of story. But what about a hadith Qudsi? In these, the companion will say, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. So the Prophet attributes that statement that is about to come straight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of them, for example, is إِنِّي حَرَّمْتُ الظُّلْمَ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us directly through the Prophet sallallahu I have forbidden oppression and wrongdoing upon myself. You can see from the type of message that it requires Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directing it at us directly. But that does not mean that every single word in that narration is a literal word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't have that divine quality. It is not something that we can use um, to gain reward just simply by reading it. Something that we said was special about the Qur'an. So that doesn't exist for the Hadith Qudsi. Additionally, the Qur'an can be recited in prayer. And that is actually required for our prayer to be valid. However, the Hadith Qudsi cannot be recited in prayer. Um, and that would not allow our prayer to be valid. So that's a short discussion on the different types of revelation. And so broadly speaking, the two sources that we all follow as believers, and we all believe in, is the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Both of them are revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not speak from his own desire. Every word uttered by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was either inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or if it was from himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would either affirm it or he would correct him. As long as the Prophet sallallahu lived with us in this world, in his worldly life, every single thing that we have recorded from him is part of the revelation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to appreciate the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Amin ya Rabbi. So continuing on, we now arrive at how did the Qur'an get revealed? We talked about the different types of revelation, we talked about what revelation is. So how did it actually get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is timeless, spaceless, to us, the creation that live in time and space? So the scholars tell us, based on several narrations from the Prophet sallallahu that there was two phases of revelation. There was the first phase in which the entire Qur'an went from, when the entire Qur'an entered into our dom dominion, our world, the lowest heavens. We hear about the seven heavens, 
the lowest heaven, encompasses us, our universe. Everything that we will ever see is going to be within this lowest universe. And that lowest universe, the Qur'an entered into that at once. And that was the first part of Revelation. Now why is this important? Because in the Qur'an, we see several ayahs that reference the Qur'an being revealed on particular days and particular months. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ We have revealed this Qur'an on the night of power. شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. Now the companions went to the Prophet ﷺ and they asked, Ya Rasulullah, how could it be that the Qur'an says this? But we know that you get revelation all throughout the year. How does that work? And so this was the response, is that there was two different revelations. The first revelation was on this special day. On this, in, during this special month of Ramadan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the lowest heaven and in fact it's mentioned in some of the narrations that it was to a place called the house of honor Baytul Izza now someone might ask um, what are the reasons for this like why would there be two why would there be a need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reveal the Quran twice and so the scholars mention some wisdoms for this one it brings more honor to the Quran and to, the, and, and to humanity with the angels. Because when the Qur'an is revealed in its entirety to the lowest heavens, the only creature who is perceiving this is the angels. But they recognize and realize that a very important profound time has come. A time has come in which the, the final... In which the final message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this world is about to start. It sets the clock moving for the final message to be delivered to, this face of the, to the face of this earth. And this message is like no other. It's a message that will last until the end of times. Every other message that came before was restricted to time and place. Whichever prophet got it, their job was to deliver this message to the people around them. Their job was to deliver this message while they were alive. And then after they passed away, generally there would be another Prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send. And that was the system back then. But after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa there are no Prophets, there are no Messengers. We no longer have a connection directly through revelation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the angels recognized that this is a very, very important thing that has just happened. And to show that, this first revelation was done. The second wisdom is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was granting the Qur'an a privilege that was granted to the other scriptures. Now something we'll see on the next slide is that the Qur'an was distinct from all the previous scriptures in this very matter, which is what when Musa salam received the Torah, he received it all at once. When the other messengers received their scriptures and revelations, they received it all at once. So someone could argue that if the Qur'an was not revealed all at once at some point, then it's kind of like, ah, is it really as superior if it can't just all be revealed at once? And so that privilege of being with the other scriptures among the divine word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was granted to the Qur'an in this first phase of the revelation. And the third wisdom here is that the Qur'an has now entered into our world. So that the two mercies for this world, the Qur'an and the Prophet wasallam, would now be in this world together. For the entire duration of the Qur'an being revealed, we had two mercies, two sources of mercy and blessing in this world with us. But if the Qur'an had not been revealed fully at once, then it would just be the Prophet wasallam. So that you know, gives us even more mercy and blessings for all the people in this world. That brings us to the second phase of revelation. Now the Qur'an has been sent down to the lowest heavens. The Prophet ﷺ is in the cave of Hira, on, on the outskirts of Mecca, contemplating, spending his time pondering upon the creation, thinking about who his creator is. 
And Jibreel alayhi salam, the archangel, appears before him. And they have this lengthy interaction in which Jibreel alayhi salam grabs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and hugs him so tightly, squeezes him until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, I thought I was going to die. It felt like the life was leaving me. It was such a tight squeeze. And then Jibreel Aisam let him go. Then Jibreel Aisam hugged him again. And then he let him go. And then he did it a third time. All three times, the Prophet Wasallam says, I felt like my soul was going to leave my body. And every single time the, the Jibreel A.S. squeezed the Prophet A.S. He would say, read. And the Prophet A.S. would say, I don't know how to read. I never learned to read. I'm an unlettered person. And Jibreel A.S. would go and squeeze him again until he felt the life leaving him. Now what was going on in this moment? In this moment we were witnessing the beginning of revelation. In this moment something unique was about to happen. There was going to be a direct contact between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this world. Something that had not happened since the time of Isa alayhi salam, many hundreds of years earlier. But as a human being, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would have a difficult time understanding and processing what was happening. Seeing an angel is hard enough. Believing that what you just saw was not just a dream. It's actually happened. That is why Jibreel alayhi salam was squeezing him to the point where he felt his life escaping. Because he needed to feel that this was real. It's kind of like how you know, uh, we see something that's really bizarre or really amazing and we're like, oh, pinch me, slap me, wake me up, shake me. Is this real? Or am I imagining things? It's kind of like that feeling that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi needed that shaking, that squeezing to bring him back to reality and tell him, yes, this is real. Yes, you are receiving the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's when the first revelation came to this world. The first five ayahs of Surah Alaq. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who has created. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Created mankind from a clot. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram Read and your Lord is the most generous Alladhi allama bil qalam The one who taught by the pen Allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam He taught man what he did not know So that began a 23 year long period when there was continuous uh, communication between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this world Jibreel alayhi salam would come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in several different ways and several different times revealing sometimes two ayahs sometimes three ayahs sometimes four or five but never too many there would be a small number of ayahs revealed every single time and those ayahs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would then memorize them understand them process them and then he would teach them to his people to the companions around him and the companions Later on, after the passing of the Prophet وسلم, they maintained this tradition of learning the Qur'an bit by bit. We live in an age, unfortunately, where we just want to consume, mass consume everything on the planet. So um, now we uh, design an AI that gives us all of the world's knowledge and compresses it into one sentence, so then we can just eat the capsule and then we're good. Right? But the companions and the Prophet وسلم, they understood something. That there is something profound about knowledge that is attained slowly. Knowledge that is attained at a rate at which your body and your mind and your soul can process it. In which you can actually practically see this knowledge implementing into, into your life around you. If, for example, I, I, I decided that I was going to memorize the entire translation of Surah Al-Baqarah in two days, maybe it's possible. You know, maybe if I spend 48 hours, maybe I'll be able to do I don't think I can, but maybe someone is able to do that. In two days, they, or they're able to memorize the translation of all of Surah Al-Baqarah. But what's going to happen a week later? Or a month later? A year later? Do they remember every single word of it? Now let's imagine the other scenario, where this person takes it one page at a time, five lines at a time, 
all they do is read those five lines in the morning, then they read those five lines when they're lunch break, they read those five lines again after work, they read those five lines again before they go to sleep. Throughout their day, they've been thinking about five verses that were five messages from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were able to focus on this small aspect of revelation and slowly doing this again and again every day of their life, over the next year, they will have absorbed so much more of the Qur'an than the person who spent 48 hours continuously trying to jam-pack everything in, only for it to leave a week later. I mean, we've all crammed for exams. And none of us remember what we did in those exams. But for the subjects that we really enjoy, where we really care about it and we spend time on it, those things we will always remember because we've spent time processing it. And that's part of the wisdom that was part of the second part of the revelation. The gradual revelation in short passages. In Arabic they say nujum. Nujum is also a word used for stars because stars are you know, little lights that shine and go um, shooting stars and you know, take a little bit of light across. Similarly, uh, the revelation is a light. It's a light of guidance. And little shooting stars of that light entered into this world one after the other, for a period of 23 years. So there was 23 years of prophethood during which the revelation of the Qur'an into the world was completed. 13 of these years were in Mecca, and 10 of these years were in Medina. A few wisdoms, we've already mentioned a few of these, but one of the main wisdoms is actually mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ الْقُرْآنُ جُمْلَةً وَاحِدًا The disbelievers, they say, why didn't the Qur'an come all down all at once? Is your Lord incapable of you know, sending this book at once? He needs time to write the next chapter. He needs time to like, think of the next message to send you. He can't do it all at once. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to that. He says, كَذَلِكَ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فؤادك. We sent it in this way to strengthen your heart, O Prophet. We gave it to you in gradual revelation because the point of it is not to brag about how much is in the Qur'an. The point of it is to take its message one bit at a time and apply it to our lives. Strengthen our resolve, strengthen our hearts, building up slowly. Um, for those who might have, who have experienced working out, um, I uh, do not. Um, you can't just go to the gym on the first day and lift 400 pounds on a deadlift. I don't know if anyone can, but... He, yeah, he can. Um, so no one can go to the gym on the first day and lift 400 pounds, right? You do that, your arms... You try to do that, you try to do like a, a press and it's never going to press, it's going to crush you, right? You're going to injure yourself severely, you'll probably end up in the ER. You spend three years training every day at the gym, you can go and do that with your eyes closed. No worry about it at all. That was the secret of gradual build-up. The Prophet's heart was being prepared to receive the most profound message that has ever entered this world. That is more heavier than any 400-pound barbell in the world. For that much weight, it required slow, gradual revelation. So that the Prophet ﷺ would fully appreciate that into his own life and fully be able to transmit it to his people. And we'll talk about this aspect a little bit more in a, in a, after. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Nabiyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. So before the Aisha break, um, we were talking about the second revelation of the Qur'an. And we talked about some of the wisdoms of the Qur'an being revealed slowly over time. And there are, you know, in more detailed works, uh, the scholars have listed many, many wisdoms. One of them, for example, is that the system and the framework that the Qur'an was bringing to the world for people to follow until the Day of Judgment was a very complex system. 
it was designed to, to bring about societal change. And that's not something that you can just send all down all at once because people won't understand it. And an example that's often given is the example of the prohibition of alcohol. Alcohol was not pro prohibited the first time there was a verse about alcohol. There were four different verses about alcohol. The first one uh, gave like an indirect warning. It's kind of like, if you know, at, at the Safeway, they started putting alcohol in the poison section, like, you know, the rat poison and like all that, the pesticide section. It's like an indirect warning. Like you walk in there, you're like, wait, it kind of feels weird. So it's like that kind of indirect warning came down. The next ayah that came down about alcohol was like a direct warning, warning about it. It's kind of like what you have on cigarette packets. It's like will cause lung cancer, may cause death. Pretty direct warning. But it's still not prohibiting. At the third stage, there was a partial prohibition that don't come to the prayer while you are drunk. If you want to keep doing it, do it at hours when you're not going to harm people. Because during the day, what do you have? You have five prayers. So if you drink between the prayers, you won't be able to make it to the next prayer. So that takes out half of the day. And then eventually, the final verse comes down that alcohol, just as gambling, is absolutely and unconditionally prohibited. But this entire process of it being four steps gives us so many lessons. And we can see it in, in the society, the, the larger society that we live in too. Alcohol is such a strong part of this culture that non-Muslims who are very, very well aware of the health harms of alcohol, you know, whatever it can cause, like liver cancer and all these different uh, cirrhosis and all these different things that alcohol is very directly related to. They know that, but they, they're like, yeah, but you know, it, it is what it is. If you don't drink, you don't live. Like, that's their motto, right? Like, it's just part of their culture. If you are having dinner, you have a cup of wine with it. Or if you are going out with friends, you're going to go drink. This is part of it. And that's how the Arabs were back in the day as well. And that's why we see that in those four stages, before the final stage of prohibition came down, there were still some companions who were drinking. Some of them left it very early on. They realized they got the hint from like the being in the poison section of the supermarket. Like, oh, you know, maybe as a wise, intelligent human being, maybe I should think about this a little bit more and kind of walk away from this. But there are other people who are human beings. Just as there are people around us in our larger community, in larger society, who are human beings, and this is just part of their culture. And so um, these kinds of mechanisms for bringing about social change while being empathetic and compassionate with people, this is something that could not be taught with the Qur'an being revealed as one giant massive book being dropped at once. It had to be revealed over time, and it had to be revealed through a guide who would live it who would show how do I teach these verses to the people? How do I implement this into my community? When the Prophet Sallallahu later in his life migrated to Medina, this was a different dynamic. He was building a community now. Before this, there were individuals who were trying to learn about their faith, trying to learn about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, who their creator was, but they didn't really have organized community. They went to Medina and they had a whole other dimension to explore now. How do you solve societal evils? How do you address different types of um, things that are harming our society? How do you create policies that will help your society and your community grow and keep developing in the right direction? Those are things we learn from the Prophet ﷺ's life as he implements the Qur'an. One of the companions came to Aisha radiallahu anha, the mother of the believers, and asked her, Describe to me the, pro the character of the Prophet ﷺ. And her response is, I mean, she could have written a whole book because his character was so beautiful and so profound. But she gave the most concise description, but it was full of so much meaning. She said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ Quran. His character was the Qur'an. The same Qur'an we're talking about today. He was a living, breathing Qur'an, walking among people, showing us how to live it. So it gives us a lot of lessons and a lot of points to ponder over 
in our own lives, in our family lives, in our community lives, um, etc., etc. Like wherever we may be, there's so many lessons for us to extract from the Quran, the way it was revealed, and all of these subtle points that the scholars have spent years of their lives discussing and, and benefiting from and uh, elaborating for us. And inshallah, at the end of the presentation, I'll share a few resources for people to read more as well. I know I've been referencing here and there all this, all this time, so uh, I think it's only fair for me to point you guys towards something, inshallah ta'ala. All right. So carrying on. The next topic here is about the modes of revelation. What were the different ways in which the revelation came down to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And these are narrated to us by the companions who witnessed the revelation coming down. So one type of revelation, which was the one that we've been talking about, and which was the majority of revelation, which was through an intermediary, which was Jibreel alayhi salam. He would bring the message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet But this would also be in two different ways. The first was as a ringing bell. Now that sounds really strange, but we'll talk about it in a few minutes. And the second is in the form of a man. Um, some of you might have heard about the famous hadith of Jibreel, in which um, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu and the companions are sitting around the Prophet wasallam, and they say a man appeared before us walking towards our gathering and he had very clean white clothes. He had very clean black hair. It did not look like he was a traveler. And this man came and he sat in front of the Prophet wasallam with his knees touching the Prophet's knees. With his hands on his thighs, sitting like an attentive person. Somebody here to benefit, somebody here to learn. And then they had a whole exchange talking about what is Islam, what is, what, what is faith, what is excellence, what are the signs of the Day of Judgment. And there was a whole discussion there. And then this man gets up and leaves. Now all the companions sitting there, they're, they're looking at each other, they're like, who is this person? None of us know him. We haven't seen him here before, but he didn't look like a traveler either. Because we're in Medina, the closest town is like so far away, and if you walk from that town to here, you're definitely going to get dust in your hair at least. In, in the desert, like one gust of wind blows and you have sand everywhere. So how is this person who looked so clean and neat? is here and we don't know him. So they're all just like puzzled and looking around. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ya Umar, atadri man hada? He said, oh, Umar, do you know who that was? And the Prophet and Umar says, Oh well, Ya Rasulullah, you and Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala know best. I don't know. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, that was Jibreel. He came to teach you your religion. So in this example, the, the archangel Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the form of a man. So that was one of the forms that the, the Jibreel would come to the Prophet The second type of mode of revelation was without an intermediary. And there's a couple of subtypes of this as well. One is as a dream. And what does it mean by ringing bell? We'll, we'll get to it in a second, inshallah. We'll read the narration in which it mentions the ringing of the bell, inshallah. So the next mode of revelation is the Prophet ﷺ would re receive it in a dream. And we'll talk about this uh, in a few minutes as well. But this was the first type of revelation that the Prophet ﷺ received, even before Jibreel ﷺ came to him in the cave of Hira. He started having true dreams. I, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha describes this. Says he started having true dreams. He would see something and the next day, he would be walking around and he would see that exact same thing happening. And so that was revelation, truth coming down in the form of a dream to the Prophet ﷺ. And there's a narration about that, after, about the time after the Prophet ﷺ, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. And the fourth type of mode of revelation is as direct divine speech behind a veil. Without an intermediary, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking directly to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This is something that also happened to Musa alayhi salam. We'll talk about all these in detail as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يُكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهِ it is, not, it is not granted to any mortal being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to him. 
except through the following ways. Illa wahyan, except through revelation. Aw min wara'i hijab, or from behind a veil. Aw yursida rasulan fa yuhiya bi idnihi ma yasha, or by sending a messenger to reveal by his command what he wills. Inna hu aliyun hakim. He is exalted and wise. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions three things. One is sort of like wahyan in this context, meaning like a direct revelation to the the prophet. Uh, for example, in the dream, or a direct inspiration in his heart. The second is from behind a veil, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa but the veil meaning that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa cannot see Allah. Or the third one is through an intermediary, which is Jibreel alayhi salam. So now, we'll talk about each of these four in turn, in detail. So the first one was like a, a loud ringing bell. And the narration for this is found in the beginning of Sahih al-Bukhari. In fact, the first chapter in uh, the most authentic collection of hadith is called Kitab Bad'ul Wahi. Kitabu Bad'il Wahi. The chapter on the beginning of revelation. Because Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, thought it was appropriate that we start our discussion of the prophetic legacy of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu with how his journey as a prophet began. And in that chapter, he brings this narration. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates. I'll read the Arabic first. An Aisha radiallahu anha. An al Haritha ibn Hisham sa'ala al Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kayfa ya'tika al Wahi. So Aisha radiallahu anha narrates that Al Harith ibn Hisham asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, How does the divine inspiration, how does Wahi, revelation, come to you? Qal, كُلُّ ذَاكَ كُلُّ ذَاكَ يَأْتِي الْمَلَكُ أَحْيَانًا فِي مِثْلِ صَلَةِ الْجَرَسِ فَيَفْصِمُ عَنِّي وَقَدْ وَعَيْتُ مَا قَالْ In all these ways, well, the ways he's going to list now. The first one, The angel sometimes comes to me with a voice which resembles the sound of a ringing bell. An extremely loud ringing sound happens that the Prophet ﷺ can hear. And when this state abandons me, I remember what the angel has said, and this type of divine inspiration is the hardest on me. So the Prophet ﷺ can be engaging in whatever action, he might be talking to someone, and if Jibreel ﷺ comes down and is revealing something to him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will hear this very loud sound. So the Prophet ﷺ will stop whatever he's doing, pay attention until the sound stops. Once that sound stops, he remembers and understands every single thing Jibreel A.S. brought to him. The words of what was brought to him is imprinted onto his heart now. And the ringing and the sound of ringing of a bell kind of gives us um, an indication to how uh, majestic the angels are. And it's such a very loud sound, a sound that nobody can ignore. And the angels are such a creature, they're a very majestic creature. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them as such. And then the Prophet said it mentions here that this type of divine inspiration is the hardest on me. Um, like experiencing that really loud ringing noise and receiving that divine message as a mortal being is a very, very difficult task in this manner. In narration from Musad Ahmad, the Prophet said adds, every time I receive revelation, I feel that my soul is being taken. Now if we think back to the narration we talked about earlier of the first revelation, the Prophet ﷺ was hugged by Jibreel ﷺ three times, squeezed until he thought his life was, his soul was going to leave his body. He was being prepared for this reality that will happen again and again and again. And in a way, it was a reminder for the Prophet ﷺ that he is still on the right path. He is still awake. He is still aware. He's not imagining things. He's not losing his mind. He's not... Um, delusional in any way this is absolutely real and it's absolutely something that is very heavy to carry for a human being and this was the toughest of modes the second one is that Jibreel a. would come in the form of a person so that same narration that we were seeing on the previous page continues on and the Prophet ﷺ says the second type of revelation is وَيَتَمَثَّلُ لِي الْمَلَكُ أَحْيَانًا رَجُلًا فَيُكَلِّمُنِي فَأَعِيْ مَا يَقُولُ 
And sometimes the angel comes to me in the shape or in the form of a man and talks to me. Similar to the narration we talked about earlier, where Jibreel came and sat in front of the Prophet. And I understand and remember what he says. Now it's interesting that the Prophet mentions this point at the end, like, oh, I understand and remember what he says. Because the question that, that's on people's minds is like, Jibreel is an angel. He's bringing a divine message. Do you understand what he says? Either as the ringing bell, you, the ringing bell is like a, even more a bigger question. Like, okay, the ringing bell doesn't even sound like language to us. So does the Prophet ﷺ understand and remember what the message was? And he confirms both times. Yes, as a ringing bell, and when Jibreel ﷺ comes to me in the shape of a man. Both of those times. I understand perfectly everything he says to me, and I remember everything perfectly. And uh, one of the very interesting uh, ayat in the Quran is one in which the Prophet Sallallahu is told by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and it's kind of like a like a mentoring opportunity or a mentorship opportunity that where the Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala advises the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, "La tuharrik bihi lisana kali ta'jarabi," because when the revelation started coming to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was so eager. He was like, "I really want to make sure that I never forget this." And so he would, as Jibreel was saying something to him, he would start repeating it back and starting to practice it as it was being said. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, don't worry. Don't move your tongue so fast so that hoping that it will settle in your heart faster. إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمْعَهُ وَقُرْآنَ It is our responsibility, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is our responsibility to make sure that the Qur'an is collected and compiled and it is recited correctly. And so, that you know, kind of connects back to what we're talking about here, in the sense that the Prophet Sallallahu would hear Jibreel and he would understand it, and he would remember it. And he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, says that this was the easiest of modes of revelation, when he came as a human being. The third type is as a dream <clears throat> in his sleep. And as we mentioned earlier, this was the beginning of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's revelation. Aisha radiallahu anha says, أَوَّلُ مَا بُدِئَ بِهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الرُّؤْيَ الصَّالِحَةً The commencement of the divine revelation to the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم was in the form of true dreams. And then after that, another thing that would happen <coughs> is the Prophet صلى would be walking and he would hear from around him, السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Greetings to you, O Messenger of Allah. And it was kind of strange for him because he didn't know he was a messenger of Allah. He didn't know who this was referring to. And then he would look around to see who was saying this and he couldn't hear, he couldn't see anyone. And so the continuation of this revelation, this uh, narration that is not on the screen right now is that the stones and the trees would send their greetings on the Prophet He would hear it, but he didn't understand it at, at that time. Later on he understood that that was part of his preparation that you will receive something that will not seem logical in this worldly sense. Something that physically, biologically does not make much sense. That you are receiving revelation from beyond the physical realm. So he is being prepared from then onwards that there are things beyond the physical. And this is part of our belief as Muslims. In the first, well, in the second surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, the first surah after Surah Al-Fatiha, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin with in the early ayahs? He says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ One of the defining characteristics of the believers is believing in the unseen, the things that are not tangible. That is an essential part of our belief. Obviously, it's built on sound reasoning that we get to the point that we have absolute faith and conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who we cannot see, who we cannot hear directly, we feel His presence. We feel each and every one of His attributes in our lives around us, in the world around us. We feel His mercy. We feel His creative, uh, creative, uh, creative agency in the world. We go into the forest and we go into the mountains and we see such beauty that humans can only dream of. The most talented of human beings to ever live in terms of art were the ones who were able to capture the natural world on a piece of paper. But what about the actual world that was created first when there was nothing to copy? 
And when we start seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His creation, we start experiencing the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all around us, it becomes a physical, tangible experience for us. And that's the journey that we are all on, is to walk towards that direction. We learn about Allah, we believe in Allah, and we learn about His attributes, we learn about His book, we learn about the message of His book, and we start seeing it everywhere. We start seeing the wisdom of every command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives. The first revelation was through true dreams. And the last mode of revelation is direct divine speech behind a veil. Now Musa alayhi salam is famous and one of his, uh, one of his popular <coughs> nicknames is Kalimullah. The one who spoke to Allah. So some of them might ask like, oh, well, didn't every prophet speak to Allah? Like they were all receiving revelation from Allah. But what was special, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in the Quran. He says, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى Not just Allah spoke to Musa. كَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا It was a real type of talking, a very direct conversation. One that not every prophet experienced. But the Prophet them did also experience this. He experienced this on his night journey to Jerusalem, to Masjid Al-Aqsa. And then he went up into the highest heavens. And Jibreel was accompanying him all the way there. They got to the furthest low tree, at which point Jibreel stopped. He said, nobody else can go beyond this except you. You have to go alone. And he went beyond that. And he entered into the Divine Presence. And there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him, the Prophet sallallahu directly. And that is where we received the command of the five prayers. We started off with 50 and then slowly came down, 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 all the way to five. So the five prayers, which are a part of our daily life, were given to us in a very, very special way. They were given to our beloved Prophet sallallahu while he was in the Divine Presence. Directly, with no intermediary, no Jibreel alayhi salam, nobody else, no dream, no indirect method. All the way directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, showing us the significance and the importance of the five daily prayers. And that is the means for us to stay anchored in this very turbulent world. That is the means for us to stay connected to the Divine throughout all the things that distract us. We go to work, we, go, we take care of our families, uh, we take care of our responsibilities, all of those are part of our religion. But all of those things have a tendency to make us forget about reality. Reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the reality of this world. We sometimes like become drugged by the world. And all we can see is the physical walls around me, the physical constraints I have. Well, what if I lose my job? The economy is not doing well, etc., etc., etc. The worldly forces are like this, like this, and like this. What we forget is that our sustenance, all benefit, all blessing, all mercy is not in the hands of the economy, not in the hands of bankers, not in the hands of my boss. It's all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the prayer reminds us of that five times every day. Because we leave that important class, that important meeting, that important obligation to turn, find the direction, and raise our hands and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that brings us to the end of today's conversation. I know I kind of like left you guys on a really high like suspense mode. And I really apologize for that. That was not intentional at all. <laughs> It was just in the, in, in the zone. Uh, it happens. So, uh, on the last slide here, we have some further readings and resources. Um, I'll walk through each one of these because I think each one of these is very important and deserves some discussion. Um, and the idea here in this list of resources is that as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we can approach the Quran and build our relationship with it in two ways. One is reading and understanding the actual message of the Quran. You know, reading different ayahs, different tafsirs, etc., etc. The second type of engagement that we can have with the Quran is learning about the Quran. And so these resources are focused on, the first few resources are focused on the second type, and then uh, the last two are going to be a little bit more general. So the first resource here is the Quran and Eternal Challenge by Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah Daraz. 
It's a, it's a book that was originally written in Arabic as an nabaul Azim by a scholar from Egypt, a very senior scholar from Al-Azhar University. And in the 50, 40s and 50s, he was a senior professor in, um, in Al-Azhar. And the scholars there sent him to France. They said, go do your PhD over there and learn about how we can disprove the Orientalist understandings of the Qur'an. Show the people of Europe the truth of the Qur'an. And so he spent 10 years in France. He wrote his whole dissertation in French. That dissertation was later translated into Arabic by himself. Um, and then one of the books that he wrote later was called an nabaul Azim. It's written as an introduction to the Qur'an and it addresses a lot of the possible questions that anyone could have about, well, did the Qur'an really come from the Prophet ﷺ? Did the Qur'an, if it came from the Prophet, did it really come from Allah? Or what if it came from somebody else? What if it, why does it copy so much, copy things from the Christians, etc., etc.? All these types of different doubts that people might have. The Shaykh addresses all of those in a very comprehensive and complete way. And the English translation was uh, done by Dr. Adil Salahi, who was a, an, a, a very, very impressive translator very experienced, very senior, has translated many, many major works. So it's a very highly recommended book. Um, the second and third works are both about the sciences of the Qur'an, which is what this discussion falls under. You have the study of the meanings of the Qur'an, and then the, the other science is called the ulum al-Qur'an, the sciences about the Qur'an. And so there's a book by Mufti Taqi Usmani, which is also available and it's been translated into English called An Approach to the Quranic Sciences. And there's a book by Dr. Yasir Qadi, An Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran. And both of them address, including today's discussion and all of the discussions that we'll be having in this series of lectures over the next year, um, different topics such as what are the different ways the Quran is split up into verses, into chapters, into um, half uh, juz, into full juz, etc., etc. What are the different divisions? How did they come about? What is the history of them? Um, what are the different reading traditions, the reading methods, the qira'at? Uh, what, are, what is the history of the Qur'anic writing? What was the, the phases of its evolution? All of these different sciences, the miracle of the Qur'an. Why is the Qur'an miraculous? What does that mean? We always say it, but what does that mean? Um, what is so profound about the Qur'an containing so many stories in it? All of these are different sciences that are discussed in Ulum al-Qur'an. Inshallah, we'll try to address some of these in the upcoming lectures, which will be in different masjids throughout the Bay Area. So we'll have one every month. And uh, um, inshallah, you can follow the Instagram page for Kitab Academy to find out the details for the next events. Then we have, uh, the, the next one is the Ibn Ashur Center for Quranic Studies and uh, run by Sheikh Suhib Saeed, uh, one of my teachers. Um, he has a YouTube channel as well as a website on which he publishes a lot of very um, de in, de in depth discussions about the Quran in English. And they're very, very beneficial and priceless discussions from a scholar who has, studied, has spent a long time studying in Egypt at, at Al Azhar. And then he later did his PhD in Quranic studies as well uh, in, in, in the UK. And now he teaches uh, through Ibn Ashur Center and he's translating and has translated very large works into English as well. And then you also have Yaqeen Institute papers by uh, a couple of scholars that I've mentioned here, Sheikh Ammar al-Khatib, uh, Dr. Nazir Khan, Sheikh Yusuf Wahab, and Sheikh Muhammad al-Shinawi. All of them have written papers on the Quranic sciences, on the preservation of the Quran, on the miracle of the Quran. So if any of these are things that interest people, or they want to learn more about these, or hopefully, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the spark of motivation towards knowledge, um, if there's any little gem or any little thread in the entire talk that interested you, then I would highly encourage you to go, to, uh, go and look at these books. A lot of these are available as PDFs um, as well, um, and you can also purchase them. Uh, but I would encourage you to read more about this topic, about all of these topics, and use that as a bridge to your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to continue building our relationship with Him. Um, in this life so that we may reach him in the next life and join the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions in the highest level of Jannah. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. We can uh, have some questions and answers inshallah. We have some time for that. Okay, I have a mic. Raise your hand. Mate, let's do sisters first. There's this more. Uh, sisters are quiet tonight. Okay, brothers. And 
Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for the beautiful lecture. Uh, I had a quick question on Hadith Qudsi that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, was Hadith Qudsi, were those words and sentences, were they constructed by Prophet by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, and they were like sent through Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so the Hadith Qudsi is a message directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in a sense, you can think of it as if we go back to our uh, the the imagery that we could, the analogy that we created of the king sending someone to deliver a message. So, in one side, you ha on the one side you have like a, the king signing like a proclamation and sending like a written document that is like very specific so that the person can go and read it. On the other hand, you have something that's like okay, go tell this person to show up tomorrow, right? So he's not going to go and say show up tomorrow. It's going to be like oh the king said show up tomorrow. But sometimes it's like. The king says, well, can you go and tell this person that he is doing a very good job? So this messenger will go and he will say, the king told me to tell you these words. You are doing a very good job. But they might not be the exact same words, but they're communicating the same sentiment. Right? So it's kind of like an in-between level between the regular hadith and the Quran, in the sense that the words aren't divine in and of themselves, but the meaning has been raised a degree to give it a higher level of importance. And generally, if you, uh, there are these short booklets that have also been translated into English that collect all of the Hadith Qudsis together. And I would encourage you to read through them. And you'll notice that there are certain themes, and those are the only themes that are covered in those. You won't find anything related to rulings, anything related to you know, other things that the Prophet has like thousands of Hadith about, thousands of statements about. Those aren't addressed there. They're very specific topics, topics that are relevant to the, the believer's direct connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it's like a very specific point of emphasis that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for the Hadith Qudsi. Yes, so uh, all of the Sunnah, including the Hadith Qudsi, are all uh, the words of the Prophet explaining the meaning that was inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Yes. Um, the All the ayah. As you said, that you know, I has not uh, everything was revealed uh, as a full through the yes. multiple times, right? So, um, so a surah was put together during the Sulaiman's lifetime. Yes. Okay. So that's a uh, there's a whole discussion there. Inshallah, the 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 talk lab next class will be a more in depth of that. But um, as a, as a short answer. The Prophet would reveal, would receive the revelation as like you know short groups of ayahs, three, four, five ayahs, yes. and then when he would receive a revelation, he would call his scribes, and he two or three of the scribes, whoever was around, would come. They would start writing as the Prophet recited it, and he would tell them, put these ayahs next to that ayah, or put them before this other ayah that I told you the other day, and so the, Rasul, the Prophet himself dictated exactly where each ayah fit into every surah. And uh, the name of the surahs was, was also decided with Sallallahu in his lifetime when they are putting all these ayahs together. So, under the yeah, so, so, so the point of ayahs within a surah, that was done by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for sure. Okay. The, and then beyond that, the labels and the titles or the, the, the names of the surahs, there's some, there's some discussion there among the scholars. Uh, the majority of scholars say that that was not from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu It was done after the Prophet Sallallahu to um, identify uh, which surah we're talking about. And a lot of times in the early generations, what we see is they refer to the surah by the first ayah. So they'll say like, Surah Amma Yatasa'alun or Surah Qul Allahu Ahad. So that's how they would refer to the surah, which is also another indication that um, the names were not from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. Sisters, any questions? Hi. Any questions online, Sister Samina? Oh, never mind. Assalamu alaikum. So I've got a question. I'm a big fan, by the way. Um, so the first inzal, the first revelation from the higher realm to the lowest heaven. Um, this is getting like technical, so if it's not meant to be answered, that's fine. But doesn't that assume a f some sort of physical revelation? Like, it, like the revelation had to have gone somewhere, even if it was instantaneous. 
do we believe uh, it was you called the debate al izza right so would that mean that there was like an angel somewhere holding on to that uh, could you just talk more about that yes so um there are several like uh, narrations and reports from the early generations about um it, you know sort of like the m more specific details of the different revelations and so some of the additional details they give about the first revelation from the highest realm and specifically they say it comes from the sacred tablet in which all of our destinies are written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because one of the first creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the pen and then the pen was told to write the destinies of every single creation that will ever be and that was written on the sacred tablet the lawhul mahfuz and within that sealed sacred tablet um, the Quran was there and so the first revelation was Jibreel alayhi salam taking the entirety of the Qur'an from the Lawh al-Mahfuz, the sealed tablet, down to the Bayt al-Izzah, the house of honor, and giving it to the, the high-ranking angels that take care of Bayt al-Izzah. Um, and so they were put in charge of receiving that there. And then afterwards, Jibreel alayhi salam would then um, either take the revelation bits and bits from Bayt al izzah or from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. And so there are narrations about both of those things happening. So it's possible that it was both or one or the other as well. I was under understanding that, that, uh, that from the lawh al mahfuz to the angels, that's still in the heavens, right? Yes, but yeah, so that, that was, um, it was handed to the angels in the lowest heaven. In the lowest Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. In the lowest heaven, with the universe. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that, okay. inshallah. Exactly. That's a very good question, though. Yeah. yeah. Welcome again. Um, building off what uh, Safiullah was saying, um, the first ever revelation, which of the four buckets does that fall under? Like, did he come to uh, the Prophet Sallallahu as a man? Or was it... Like which one of the four was that? Yeah, so the first revelation in which he uh, hugged and squeezed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was as a man. Because um, th as if we look at the continuation of the story of the first revelation, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam descended from the mountain into the valley next to it, um, Jubilee Alaihi Wasallam appeared to him in his true form. And he covered the horizons. And everywhere the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looked, you could see Jubilee Alaihi Wasallam. And he was a very immense and majestic creature. And so that was his true form. But when he appeared earlier, it was in the human form. And that was the human form that would appear multiple times during the during life of the Prophet I feel they were planted, <laughs> some of these guys. Um, sister, is there any questions? Do uh, you know them? He actually, like, he's my teacher. I don't know why he's asking uh, me questions. <laughs> unless you're a long-time caller. <laughs> yeah. Sister, is there any questions here? Sister Nama? So just off of assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Uh, just off of what you were saying about the angel Gabriel coming to the Prophet وسلم, in, in a human form, does that mean that every single time he came down as a man, he was in the same form, or did he look differently? So like from when he first uh, gave the revelation on Jabal al Nur versus like uh, in in the story you were saying where where the where the angel came down and he was in his white felt clean, didn't look like a traveler, but came down as a man. Was yeah. it the same form? Well, <clears throat> there's nothing that says that specifically he was the same form every single time. Okay. And one of the reasons, one of the, you know, the texts that we could use to say that it's possible that he actually did not come in the same form was that uh, exact narration of him coming down and, and he, we knew that he was not a traveler, he did not look like a traveler. No one recognized him, but that's happening in Medina very late in the Prophet's life. Oh, so they've seen the process in receiving revelation for so many years now, and they didn't recognize him still. Yeah. So it's very likely that uh, he came in different forms. But the Prophet recognized him whenever he came. Jazakallah okay. khair. What did it look like through the companion's eyes like when watching the Rasul re receive revelation? Like, if they were actively watching him receive it, what did it look like? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so there are a couple of narrations that we have that are very vivid descriptions of this. Um, uh, the mother of the believers, Aisha, Allah, she mentions one time the Prophet had his head in her lap um, and he started receiving revelation. 
and she said that the weight of his head became so much she thought like it was going to get cr going to crush her leg and she could see so much sweat coming from the forehead of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam like he was intensely like under pressure and under stress so she could see those physical effects on him uh, and then there's another narration that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was once on a riding animal and uh, I, I can't remember if it was a horse or a camel but he was riding on an animal and he received revelation and the animal like its feet just like buckled and it fell down because it was too much weight coming down on the Prophet ﷺ. So there were definitely physical manifestations on the Prophet ﷺ, uh, as the revelation came down on him every single time. Yeah. Quite on the spot tonight. <laughs> All right, I think uh, online viewers are pretty quiet tonight too. Seems like you're pretty extensive on. <laughs> so or good. I just confused everyone. Either way. Okay, do you want to read it, Sister Samina? We have an online viewer. Uh, want to read it? All right, online viewer says, what's the difference between the wahi of Prophet and the wahi which the mother of Musa received? That's a very good question. I'm so. The scholars, they, the way they understand revelation, um, and if you go back and see the, the definition we had for revelation, for wahi, on the slides as well, is that that's the particular divine um, communication that signals the start of prophethood. And then, after prophethood starts, the communication continues until that prophet receives all of the commands and prohibitions that they need to communicate to their people. So, this particular thing that we are talking about, about revelation, wahi, is specific to prophets. And what the mother of Musa salam, received, and how the scholars explained that, is that was a form of inspiration. And that form of inspiration, the scholars say that can be received by anyone from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires a person to do something good. Or if somebody is struggling, uh, the sunnah of the Prophet salam, is to do something called istikhara. When you have two, dis two choices, two options, you're very, you've done all your research, you've done all of your um, background check, and you're like, okay, I really can't decide between these two things. Prophet said, pray two rak'ahs, read this dua called the dua of istikhara. Istikhara means um, asking for goodness. So you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you whatever is best for you. And then the scholars say you start moving in the direction that seems like the right move at that point. And that's part of the, the, uh, the inspiration that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. Obviously, the more righteous and the more pious a person is, um, they feel it a lot stronger and they realize that something is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus from like shaitan or from some other source. And so the mother of Musa alayhi salam, a uh, very pious woman, uh, received inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this was the right thing to do. Um, and so, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, let's go wrap up and show. All right, Jazakumullah khairan everyone. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit from everything that was said. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for any mistakes or any shortcomings. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be of those people who are uh, the people of the Quran. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be of those people who are beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we ask you, Ya Allah, to make us of those people who you love, Ya Allah. And we ask you, Ya Allah, to make us of those people who are reunited with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions in the highest levels of Jannah. Amin Ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhana Rabbik Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifoon. Wa Salaamun Ala Al-Mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum.